Welcome to part eight, the final lecture on the coming 2026 financial and economic crisis. As discussed earlier in this series of lectures, the proponents of modern monetary theory argue that conventional wisdoms regarding money creation and debt have little relation to reality. Their analysis raises the important issue of whether our society would be much better off if the U.S. Treasury simply bypassed the Federal Reserve by directly creating monetary units allocated to government departments as budgeted and spent into the economy. Federal Reserve notes would be replaced by debt-free money in digital form and as Treasury-issued paper currency. We should remember that coinage minted by the federal government is debt-free money, even though our need for coinage has greatly declined. Until quite recently, I held on to my understanding as a former bank officer that banks are intermediaries, taking in deposits, earning fee income, and using cash balances to make loans to individuals, entities, or even public institutions. My early formal training in accounting always convinced me that one must actually have assets in order to transfer these assets to others, even temporarily. Apparently, banks have some special legal authority to create monetary assets out of thin air just by recording a loan to someone. This is explained by Francis Coppola in an article published in Forbes magazine in 2017. She writes, money is created when banks lend. The rules of double entry accounting dictate that when banks create a new loan asset, they must also create an equal and opposite liability in the form of a new demand deposit. This demand deposit, like all other customer deposits, is included in central banks measure of broad money. I add only that one of my early responsibilities as an officer for a commercial bank was to write the accounting procedures for the bank's residential mortgage loan department. The accounting I was taught and utilized required these entries to record a loan of funds from one party to another. The funds had to be found somewhere, whether from cash on hand or whether borrowed from third parties, whether assets had to be sold, somewhere the cash had to be found in order to make a loan to someone. Francis Coppola continues, following the money. In this sense, therefore, when banks lend, they create money. But this money has in no sense been, quote, spirited from thin air. It is fully backed by a new asset, a loan. If this statement confuses you, I admit to being confused as well. I will shortly offer my thoughts on how to bring the banks back into their appropriate role as an intermediary. But first, a short history lesson might be useful. If the federal government can simply create money and spend it into the economy, is there still a case to be made for what was centuries ago called receipt money? that is, currency that is actually a receipt for coinage deposited and held by a deposit bank, such as the Bank of Amsterdam was chartered to be. For many years, going back to my formal studies, I have argued in favor of creating an international system of deposit banks. I continue to see merit in such a systemic bulwark. What if nations agreed to monetize some portion of their gold and or silver reserves, meaning they would each mint coinage of a standard weight and metallic content? This coinage would be deposited in the government-owned deposit bank. Private individuals and entities could become depositors slash members by acquiring precious metals, which are minted by the government and the value credited to their accounts with the bank. This part of the money supply could be used for purchases from sellers located in other nations with no risk that the currency would experience declining purchasing power. Note that this system of deposit banks is not a return to the gold standard. 
The banks and their depositors will be engaging in commerce on a basis that offers depositors an alternative to a contractual agreement to accept fiat currency. Depositors could, if interested in holding coinage themselves, withdraw coinage from their accounts. However, the likelihood of many doing so, given the cost of storage and security, would seem to be quite low. Their digital balances held by the government banks would truly suffice. In certain circumstances where the parties want secrecy, a treasury receipt similar to this one could be obtained and utilized. It must be acknowledged that the use of gold coins as currency is in a number of ways economically inefficient and environmentally harmful. That said, there is already in the vaults of central banks and national governments a huge amount of gold that serves no purpose whatsoever other than to satisfy the ancient view that the more precious metals held, the wealthier the nation or the person. Within the economics community, there is considerable disagreement over the wisdom of returning to some form of gold standard, but almost no disagreement that the system established at Bretton Woods, creating the gold exchange standard and fixed exchange rates between currencies, was doomed to eventual collapse. Public choice economist James M. Buchanan put forward a number of ideas in the quest for money with a stable purchasing power, including the rather novel idea that currency could be denominated and redeemable in construction bricks. Professor Buchanan first heard about this idea as originating with C.O. Hardy, its substance passed along in an oral tradition by other scholars. Buchanan resurrected the idea formally in an article titled Predictability, the Criterion of Monetary Constitutions, appearing in a volume edited in 1962 by Leland B. Yeager. As Buchanan writes, It will be useful to consider the advantages and disadvantages of common brick as the basis for an automatic monetary system. The government sets a schedule of money prices for common building brick of specified quality. At the same time that this price is announced, a public authority, which we shall call the Mint, announces its willingness to buy and sell units of common brick at the specified price in unlimited amounts. Money is issued from the Mint only in exchange for common brick, and money proceeds from the sale of common brick by the mint are impounded in the mint. Every individual has the assurance that he can at any time take a common brick or any quantity of common brick or a certificate of ownership of brick to the mint and receive in exchange a monetary unit, say a paper dollar. No additional monetary or fiscal policy need take place. Having no powers to create or destroy money, other than those implicit in the rules governing the operations of the Mint, the government has to finance expenditures through taxation or through real borrowing. Thinking about this idea, one readily comes to the conclusion that construction bricks have nearly all of the positive characteristics of gold or silver and none of the negative characteristics. There is ongoing demand for bricks. They can be produced easily and to a rigid standard all over the world. They last for centuries. There is no need for the construction of expensive storage vaults or security systems to prevent theft. I leave this proposal here for you to ponder as Buchanan offered for our consideration. Returning to the issue of how banks operate, I would argue that granting to the banks the privilege of making loans without having the cash to do so is inherently fraudulent for the reason that a bank should be required to have the cash with which to make a loan. When a bank is created, its owners contribute the cash that becomes the bank's asset from which expenses are paid and any loans are made. The bank increases its ability to make loans by offering services to the public, for example, checking and savings accounts that attract deposits of cash, which becomes part of the bank's assets, offset by a liability on the books. 
then subject to appropriate reserves held back to protect depositors from losses incurred when borrowers default. The bank is in a position to make loans with this cash. If the risks are prudently analyzed and underwritten and then priced for, the bank earns interest and perhaps a loan origination fee and eventually is repaid. In this sense, the bank is and acts as a financial intermediary. Banks can also make their loan assets available to other investors. They can pool loans together as collateral for a special kind of bond. A mortgage-backed security is one example of this type of bond where some number of mortgage loans are the specific assets generating the cash flow in order to pay interest to bondholders and gradually or eventually repay the principal. The risk of having to bail out failing banks could be dramatically reduced if, as Mason Gaffney proposed, a law was passed that prohibited any financial institution that accepted government-insured deposits from providing loans for the purchase of land or accepting land value as collateral for any borrowing. Thus, when land values fall, as they will when the cycle reaches its maximum stress point, the outstanding loan balances associated with real estate lending would correspond to the depreciated value of whatever building is mortgaged as collateral. Other investors with a greater appetite for risk would step in and price for the risk of lending on land. There is a growing sentiment that states and cities would benefit by establishing public banks charged with serving the financial needs of the community rather than creating shareholder value or maximizing return on investment. Advocacy for public banks has been championed for over a decade by California attorney Ellen Brown, who founded the Public Banking Institute in 2011. Because of her efforts, a growing number of elected officials are learning that the public bank model has existed for over a century in the state of North Dakota. What a state can achieve by forming its own bank has been demonstrated in North Dakota. There, the nation's only state-owned bank was formed in 1919 when North Dakota farmers were losing their farms to big out-of-state banks. Unlike the Wall Street megabanks mandated to make as much money as possible for their shareholders, the Bank of North Dakota is mandated to serve the public interest. Yet it has had a stellar return on investment outperforming even J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs. The BND maximizes its profits and its ability to serve the community by eliminating profiteering middlemen. It has no private shareholders bent on short-term profits, no high-paid executives, no need to advertise for depositors or borrowers, and no need for multiple branches. It has a massive built-in deposit base since the state's revenues must be deposited in the BND by law. And what about the corporate form of ownership itself? What legal privileges are the source of the most destructive activities on the part of corporate executives? A good starting point would be to add diversity to corporate boards to include some seats held by non-management employees elected by fellow employees, other seats could be reserved for representatives of institutions such as universities holding some level of shares in the corporation. Wall Street firms like to talk about investment fundamentals. They trade in equities that can increase or decrease in price by almost any percentage in just a day. One might rightly ask whether values have anything to do with the actual financial health of the corporate entity, or is the equity market essentially a gambling casino? Should corporate executives be permitted to order the repurchase of their own stock using borrowed funds to pay for the stock? There are too many issues for us to discuss here. These issues need objective analysis that leads to the right regulatory and legislative actions. A full examination of reforms to our political system would require a long series of lectures devoted just to this topic. 
without devoting any time to specific reforms. I list those that appeal to me as consistent with the expansion of participatory democracy. These include term limits for legislators, public funding of elections, rank choice voting, elimination of the electoral college and establishment of the direct election of the president and vice president, elimination of life appointment for positions on the U.S. Supreme Court. You may be able to think of many others that should be added to this list. I leave the final words on our state of affairs to Henry George, not from his book Progress and Poverty, but from Social Problems. If I have accomplished anything with this series of lectures, it is to validate the urgency expressed by George. He writes, the great work of the present for every man and every organization of men who would improve social conditions is the work of education, the propagation of ideas. It is only as it aids this that anything else can avail. And in this work, every man who can think may aid, first by forming clear ideas himself, and then by endeavoring to arouse the thought of those with whom he comes in contact. And with that, we've reached the end of this series of lectures. I hope I've provided you with food for thought. Thank you.